Is there a volunteer? Thank you. We have two volunteers. Five, 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 ten minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for showing up. Uh, thank you also, um, Sarah, for suggesting this, uh, inspiring this, this, uh, this convening. Um, um, and uh, okay, and it's recorded, so hopefully people who aren't here can watch it. And I'm a little ambivalent about that because I think maybe you'll have questions that I won't be able to answer right now. But that's also good because uh, then I'll get back to you. Uh, I want to sort of provide a basic overview of some of the really core. Um, uh, con sorry, one second. This is um, one second. Sorry, that was. Um, core concepts of Hilchot Kashrut uh, and some of the, nothing here is obscure or at all um, controversial, but it's not necessarily widely known. I think it's really helpful. Like I spent the better part of a year in yeshiva studying um, like Yerdeh, Hilchot Kashrut. I would say of that year, the sources we're going to look at is like 75%, 90% of the halakha questions I get, just the right. So what we're going to do in the next 40 minutes is like the most productive use of my year in, in your idea, year in Shiva, okay? Um, the source sheets that are on the shulchan, that are on the table that you're taking, please take them, but know that they're gonna be replaced by better source sheets that are being printed right now, okay? Mine has two different ones. I think they're actually the same. They're just using versions of the same source, ah. okay? So, first thing, uh, something that you wouldn't know about keeping kosher from the Torah, but that the Talmud assumes about kashrut is a concept called tam ki'ikar, which means the taste is like the thing itself. Okay, this is sort of, maybe you're familiar with this, if not the phrase, with the way it's applied, right? Keeping kosher, uh, like if you keep it in a strict way, it's not just about I don't eat certain foods, but I also i am careful about what is in my kitchen or which utensils I use, and that's all the outcome of uh, tam ki'ikar, that not only are we concerned about the ikar, the essence of the forbidden substance, but also the tam, the flavor, the taste of that forbidden substance. So if some, uh, if a big chunk of bacon falls into your chillant and you are a pork um, loin, falls into your chillant and you take it out, uh, it's gone, it's not in the chillant anymore, but it's, it's left, its flavor has gone to the chillant and now we have to be concerned, okay? And as maybe you know, right, if there's 60 times the volume of the chillant uh, to nullify the, 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 the pork chop, then we're okay, okay? Because we say that nothing can, or a few things can impart taste in 60 times uh, their volume. But again, that's if we remove the pork chop because we assume that, um, that there's, there isn't actually the thing itself, it's just the taste that is left uh, behind. So then we have rules about what we call havarat tam, the, the transfer of, of taste. Um, the rabbis assume that taste is a real thing. It's something that can be, it's a physical thing. In the, it's not kudis, right? It's, it's like tam, it's the actual taste of a substance which follows laws of physics, right? It, it, it is absorbed by certain subjects and it's expelled by certain objects, right? Under certain circumstances that are described and defined in the laws of kashu. For us, it seems a little bit like hoodies because it's hard for us to um, observe those, um, the transfer of taste, but that's really because we have modern um, materials in our kitchens. Almost everything in your kitchen was invented in the last hundred years, meaning every substance your countertops and your pots and pans and your utensils are made from alloys or plastics or etc. That, that were invented, rubber that were invented in their current form in the last hundred years. Uh, if you use a cast iron skillet, uh, it will absorb taste. And it will not only absorb taste, it will pellet. It will bolea u pellet. It will absorb and then spit out that taste in the next thing you cook, right? If you um, use your wok, right? You're supposed to like it, like it's supposed to, you're not supposed to wash it with soap because it absorbs the taste of everything you cook in it and then it, it gives that taste to everything else that's cooked in it. That's because it's a wok is made out of, I guess, iron or something. It's not a uh, modern alloy uh, and it absorbs the taste. If you use a cutting board to slice an onion and then you cut an apple on that cutting board without washing it well, it will taste like an onion, right? That's the taste is absorbed in the wood and then it's expelled into the next thing, right? So, with modern alloy, you know, 100 years ago, or whatever, I forget when stainless steel was. Stainless steel is an amazing invention. It was um, um, really tr totally transformed how we experience food. Before stainless steel, if you weren't rich enough to afford um, like gold or silver silverware, uh, then your food tasted like your silverware, right? Um, stainless steel is amazing, and it was discovered, I think, by accident. Somebody was doing research on a bunch of metals <laughs> in a workshop, and he was tossing the alloys that he was working with into a big pile, a scrap heap, and then he noticed that one of them wasn't rusting. 
like two weeks later, and that was stainless steel. Okay, so it's amazing. And maybe like Kashu, you know, like the, you know, the rabbis could have decided stainless steel doesn't absorb taste, and etc. And then things would have been much easier in some ways, but they didn't go that way. Okay, so we still have these rules, even though we can't, um, we don't actually experience it. But for all of halakhic literature, it's assumed that these are real. Uh, like physical phenomenon of how taste is absorbed and transferred and moves around. Some of the rules of transfer of taste are very important, right? It has to be piping hot for the transfer of taste to occur. If things are not piping hot, transfer of taste doesn't occur. What's the definition of piping hot in the literature? There are actually two versions in the Bible and Yushalmi. One is Ein Hayad Sholetet Bahen, that's the Yushalmi. It's so hot that your hand can't like hold it. And in the Bavli, it's Hayad so let it behead. Your hand recoils from touching it. It's exactly the same. Okay, right? It's just two different. One is positive, one is negative. It's other other places in halakhic literature. It's called the hot enough to um, to burn a baby's belly, um, which is you shouldn't. I, I know somebody who called, who wanted to try to get a quantification for that, and he um, he didn't. No, no. He called. He called. I think he called like child protective services and said. How hot is like too hot to like? Be? And they said, "Oh, you should never." You should be. No, I know, but just tell me how hot. Stay <laughs> <laughs> you know, the line, sir. Okay, no. <laughs> right. And then the next day uh, they showed up and it's great. So, any event, but but you can, but that means this means that if you're washing your hand, if you're washing dishes by hand, your hands are there in the sink, and you're doing something with your dishes. Then, by definition, uh, it's not so hot that you can't put your hands in it, and so there's not going to be havarat time. There won't be transfer of taste. It won't be absorbed or transferred or swallowed up in one thing or another. So that, that's another, right? That's another like, huge ground of leniency. Uh, you need heat in order for taste to be transferred. Um, I just thought of one minute. Um, another, another rule, uh, which is sort of about Havaratan, we say, Ein bolea yotse mi chaticha el chaticha beli rotev. This is not in the source sheet, but it's an important principle. You don't have a taste that's absorbed in, some, in one thing. Thank you so much. Uh, not, print a round of paper. Oh, do, do you want to, do you mind refilling it? Uh, no. The paper's in the office, thank you. Uh, it's one of, one of these keys will open the office and you'll find the paper, I think. It's like, thank you so much. I, don't, um, I already have one, you listen to someone else. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, that's Murphy's law. That's not okay. Yeah. Um, that means that if something is absorbed in one thing, it can't leave that thing and go into something, another thing, without rotev, with sauce or like a liquid medium. Okay. So if you have um, um, some piece of food that absorbs some non-kosher taste. Uh, and it's adjacent to another piece of food, uh, the, the thing, the non-kosher taste can leave piece A and go into piece B if they're wet or, f if they're wet or fatty and they're adjacent in that way. But if they're dry, um, then they can be in proximity, right? It, it won't go. A more common application is from pot to burner or from oven rack to pan, right? If you have things in pot, right? Nothing absorbed, right? So if some, um, if some, you're cooking on a stove and some dairy like splashes over onto your burner, and it's, it's hot, right? Piping hot, so the dairy taste is absorbed in the burner. Um, so, so you clean off the burner, so there's no longer actual mama shoot, there's no longer real food, it's just the absorbed taste. So that absorbed taste, as long as everything is clean, like it's absorbed in the burner. It can't get from the burner to your pot because ain chati chay ain bol, ain, <laughs> something swallowed, something absorbed in one thing can't become absorbed into something else without a liquid medium. And so your pot is clean and dry, the burner is clean and dry. Uh, even if something is absorbed into the pot or absorbed into the burner, dairy meat or kosher, non-kosher, it, it won't transfer uh, without um, uh, some liquid medium, which is why things are much more lenient for a modern oven. Like we don't cook in ovens the way like we don't roast directly on ovens the way they once did, or bake directly on ovens the way they once did. We don't roast things on spits so much anymore. We cook things in pans, in pots, right? There isn't direct contact um, between food and, and uh, the, the surface of the, uh, of the container, right? So that, that also is a huge ground for leniency in you know, many, many situations in the common kitchen. Got that, or? Well, I'm just curious, how does that apply then like, to an oven in terms of like you have meat and then milk? Like so, so oven, let's, so yeah, you look, you, so an oven, what we're concerned about with an oven really is uh, stuff maybe is, um, 
one is a question of maybe like the Tama talks of Recha Milta Le Recha Lava, is the smell an issue or not? Right? This Tama what we're talking about, and there's Recha, like the smell of things. The smell. So maybe you have dairy and meat cooking in the same oven at the same time, so the smell of one is mixing with the smell of the other. And is that or is that not a concern? And so we say in a small oven it is a concern, in a large oven it's not a concern actually, essential halacha, uh, if it's a fan, if it's an a oven with ventilation or a large oven you can actually have dairy and meat at the same time, even in the oven, or kosher, non-kosher, in the same oven, at the same time, that's the essential halakha in the Shulchan Aruch. We don't do that anymore. We're a little bit more strict. We're worried really about um, maybe steam rising, maybe the steam rises, maybe it condenses in the oven. Okay, so the, the sort of the practice that I recommend for ovens is you pick one gender that you cook uncovered and one gender that you cook covered in the oven, and if you want to cook the other gender uncovered, you heat the oven, sort of like kasha the oven, by heating it to hotter than the temperature at which the earlier thing was cooked at, or you wait 24 hours and then it's fine regardless. The 24 hour rule we'll get to in a minute. Okay, that will emerge. Got that? The oven, the, 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 okay. Um, okay, next. <laughs> once we're talking about time, once we're talking about the taste of a thing and how it's transferred, how it's absorbed, and how it impacts kasha, Tom, this taste that we're worried about, it turns out, is only a, it's only an enhancing taste. A taste that makes the thing it goes into taste better. Um, a good taste as opposed to a bad taste, okay? So, uh, source one. Kol devar she ta'amo pagum, eno oser ta'ro v'to, afilu ein ta'amo pagum ma'chmad atzmo, shefni atzmo hu mut'am u'meshubach, ele shepokem ta'ro v'to, mut'ar. Anything, a forbidden substance, but it doesn't taste good. So you don't have the thing itself in your tarovit, in your mixture, you just have the taste of that thing, but the thing doesn't taste good. So what you're left with is not the thing itself, just the taste. So what would be an example? So also, he says it's not, it doesn't have to be a thing that tastes bad in and of itself. It could taste delicious, like pork chops, but in its tarovit, in this particular mixture, it tastes bad. Uh, why? Because it's pork chops that fell into your ice cream, that's it, right? <laughs> so that's disgusting. So in that case, even if the little bit of like pork taste is there in your ice cream, that's fine because that's not an enhancing taste, that's a detracting taste. It's a bad taste. And that bad taste is determined by the context in which it's in. So uh, that's often a, so this is, why is that grounds for leniency, or why is it so significant? It's significant um, in two reasons. One, because it's, um, thank you, it's, thank you very, very much. Um, um, so we replace the old, they're both, it's hard to tell the difference, I guess, but uh, the one that I want you to have has your day in 95 as uh, source three. Okay. There's a timestamp on it. There's a timestamp on it. Oh, amazing. She, she, she has it already. Great. Okay. Um, that's cool. All right. Um, um, so since, since we define whether something is pagum or not, there's no tentam nifgan, whether it, enhan it imparts a negative taste or whether it imparts a positive taste based on that tarovit, the mixture that it's in, if there's some other substance that tastes bad, and this is explicit in the, this is even more clear in one of the other si'ifim in uh, Siman 103, uh, if there's some other substance there that makes it taste bad, um, let's say, let's say um, it's pork in your... Um, like let's say the, 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 the non-kosher, I mean, the, the example in the Shulchan Aruch is the non-kosher ingredient maybe tastes fine, but because there's salt in this mixture, the salt makes the non-kosher ingredient taste bad. So then it's still matar. The tarovet, the, the full mixture, is still fine. A more common example would be uh, if there's the addition of uh, something that tastes bad. Uh, what would be a common example in your home kitchen? Something that you would maybe often put on your dishes or... Salt? Uh, salt, salt doesn't taste bad. What, what do you? Soap. soap, soap. Yes, soap. Exactly. Soap is yes. Soap tastes bad. So even if the non-kosher ingredient tastes good, uh, and it would even taste good in the context of the thing it's being mixed with, um, if it's mixed in with soap, uh, then, that, then 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 it's a tam pagum. And taste is a bad taste. It's a rancid taste. Soap is mixed in this mixture, uh, and that's also going to be grounds for leniency. So again, if you're doing dishes, a doing dishes by hand. Um, if, you, if your hands are there, it's probably not, um, I mean, it's almost perfect. It's like it makes sense you have gloves on, okay? If your hands are using dishes by hand, it's not uh, so hot that taste can transfer. But even so, maybe you're holding the dishes by the side and it is really hot. 
Um, but if there's soap in the mixture, so the soap is mixed with a non-kosher food, so it's a tam pagum, it's a rancid taste, and a rancid taste, if you're just talking about the tam itself, uh, it doesn't cause kashi problems. So uh, if you're loading a dishwasher, I always um, will spread a little extra soap, like outside of the canister, so as soon as the dishwasher starts running, soap is like kind of mixed in there at the very beginning of the cycle, so that Maybe I put the wrong you know, fork in or something like that. There's soap in there as well. The t it's mixed with all the food, uh, and it's the, 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 the food immediately like, imparts a rancid taste, and that, that uh, is going to be grounds for leniency. But the real reason why this is really powerful <laughs> uh, is when you combine these concepts together, of this issue of tam balua, of absorbed taste, and this concept that tam lifgan, that a rancid taste, doesn't cause kashu problems. And that occurs because of source two, which is the continuation of Source one, this is also your day 103. Okay, so this means that any, any pot or pan cooking utensil, if it hasn't been used for 24 hours <coughs> since it was used for some forbidden, cooking some forbidden substance, then the taste that's been absorbed in the pot has become rancid. Uh, and then the taste that it then expels into what's cooked next um, is going to be a rancid taste and it's not going to render the new substance not kosher. So some examples. You have a pot, you use it to cook lobster bisque, okay, on Monday. On Wednesday, you use it to cook pasta. So the pasta, so what happened? So you cook, it's cooking lobster, bi lobster, lobster bisque. It's uh, clam chowder, let's say clam chowder, that's good. Uh, it's... Uh, um, is that clam taste that was absorbed in the pot, but then 24 hours went by, and so now there's rancid, yucky clam chowder taste absorbed in the pot. You then use it to cook pasta. What, 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 what gets imparted into the, into the pasta, into the rice, into the chillings, whatever it is? Rancid lobster, uh, clam chowder taste. Rancid clam chowder taste is not going to render what you cook in this pot next unkosher. So you may say, if that's the case, why do we need uh, kosher pots? The Talmud asks this question. The Talmud says it's just a gazer, it's a rabbinic decree, uh, lest we uh, mistakenly use non-kosher pots within 24 hours. <coughs> okay, but bidi evid, bidi evid means after the fact, it's, it's, the food is kosher. So okay, this means that lechachila, um, ad initio, <laughs> in the first instance, you can't use a non-kosher pot. But once the food is cooked in a non-kosher pot, the pot hasn't been used in 24 hours to cook something non-kosher, the food that's cooked is kosher. Okay, so this means you go to Aunt Sadie's house and she makes you uh, an egg or, or a pasta uh, in her dishes, in her, right, in her non-kosher pot. So the bidi eved, like l'chadchila, you can't use those pots. Bidi eved, once she's used them to cook something entirely kosher, uh, that food is in fact entirely kosher. Okay, a few important caveats though of this rule. Uh, or caveats and, and details. One detail, we have an assumption that stam kewim enan b'nei yoman, which means that um, we can assume that any pot or pan or cooking utensil has not been used for 24 hours. You don't have to know. Um, you don't have to like have specific, if you, let, you know, in the absence of specific knowledge that I used this pot 10 hours ago, we can assume it wasn't used for 24 hours. You go to Aunt Sadie's house, you don't have to ask her uh, when was this pot used. Uh, or, right, or, or okay. Um, the assumption is most, pot, and that same is true for forks, et cetera, right? We can assume they weren't used within 24 hours. Uh, you stick your, you know, whatever, like a dairy fork into your meat soup, like um, we can assume that that dairy fork spoon was not used within 24 hours, okay? In that instance, just by the way, just let's say you take, so let's say you take a, a, a more common example would be what's in a common, common example. Let's say you use a, uh, you have a small, a small bowl of meat soup and you take a dairy spoon by mistake and put it in the meat soup. So let's think this through. So what's happened? So let's say, is the meat soup piping, um, piping hot? So maybe it wouldn't be because it was in the pot and then you put, took it in the ladle and then you put it into the bowl. So maybe by definition it's not piping, it's cliche leashy maybe. Uh, so that would also, maybe it's not piping hot anyway. But let's say you heated the soup in the microwave. So it's like boiling and bubbling in that little bowl. Uh, and then you stick your dairy spoon in. So the dairy spoon is not, was not used within 24 hours for dairy. We have that assumption, okay? Because, we can assume that, that it wasn't, unless you know for sure it was. 
so the spoon now, it's a dairy spoon and it absorbs this meat taste from being stuck into, the, into the, your bowl of chicken soup. So the spoon now has to be kosher, but your chicken soup, uh, you don't have to worry about is there 60 times the volume of the soup to nullify the volume of the spoon. You don't have to enter those calculations that the spoon was not used within 24 hours. We don't have, we just assume it wasn't. Stam Kalim, right? We just, without, in the absence of specific knowledge to the contrary, we have that assumption that Chazaka about Kalim. We could also question whether it was really a dairy spoon, because was the spoon ever used for really piping hot dairy? A right? few spoons are, unless you use, uh, I don't know, use it for like. Uh, um, creamy soup. Creamy soup, yes. Piping hot creamy soup, yes. And if you're putting the dairy utensil into something that's meat, but it's cold, you don't have to do anything. Mince them is fine. Correct. Correct, correct. Yeah, if you're eating cold, you can eat cold cereal with milk in your meat bowls. That's fine. And that, yeah, that's, that's fine. One other important caveat, though. This assumption that Stam Kalim, that generic cooking utensils, have not been used for 24 hours, doesn't apply in commercial restaurants, right? In a commercial kitchen. In a commercial kitchen, the volume of what they're doing is so great that you, it's just the rules are going to be different. So even though if Aunt Sadie makes you some pasta in her non-kosher whatever, we, we, we don't have to ask her, when did you last use this pot? You know, we assume that Bidiyeve, the food is kosher. Um, in a commercial kitchen, like at a restaurant, even something like fish or pasta, we can't have that assumption that it wasn't used for 24 hours. And so even something like pasta or rice or fish or whatever, something very innocuous, <coughs> boiled carrots, um, since they made it in their pots that were used for non-kosher food, that could really, there's a real um, likelihood that that carrot is actually not kosher because it absorbed uh, the taste from the non-kosher food that was used in that pot just the day before. Unless maybe the restaurant is closed for a long weekend and you, you go there right after they open. And, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe then, Vidyevin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the more common case in the classical literature is, is with Jewish travelers who would go to an inn and they would uh, like give you a pot and say, here, cook your dinner. Um, so in that case, so they say, well, you know, you don't have your pot, you're traveling, you're under extenuating circumstances, that, Shot that just being in that condition is Bidiyeve, that is like Bidiyeve, and so you can use those pots uh, to cook yourself dinner uh, when you're staying at the inn. And that was done, like that was, yes? Did you use your Nelphic spoon dip it into the chicken soup or whatever? Can, does, does the spoon then become flaky? Yes, spoon now, the spoon now, the spoon is not kosher, because the spoon has, was already dairy, because it absorbed dairy taste. And now it's absorbed meat taste. So now it has both tastes oh, absorbed wait, inside wait. it. I thought you said if it, if it lasts, absorbed the dairy. The taste, the taste that it would impart into the chicken soup would be a rancid taste. And so it wouldn't cause any problems in the chicken soup. But that now it's, but it still has meat and this dairy taste inside it. And so it needs to be kosher. Um, um, so the food's okay, but the implement is not? In that case, in that circumstance, yes. Oh. I had a case when I was visiting Israel. And these people were very religious. Uh, they just made a mistake. Uh, the wife cooked a powder soup in a milk of pan and then her and put it in a milk of bowl. And then her husband gave me a flashic spoon. Yeah. And then she said, Oh no, it's the wrong spoon. I already had some. Yeah. So she just took the spoon away and gave me another one. Yeah, that's fine. We'll see, I mean we'll talk about that next. That's next. Okay, let's go on to the next uh, um, so now, <laughs> source. Um, oh, wait, one more quick oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So, is this only the case if it's an object that can be kosher? So, is it depending on the material? No. <laughs> so, if you use your ceramic, like something which can't be kosher, like like uh, certain types of ceramics right. or, or earthenware, uh, tough luck. You might lose your if you use a spoon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> She asked if this was the case uh, only with things that are, that can't, that are kosherable, and, and the answer is not. It's really about the food that's absorbed and, and expelled. Things like, you know, I mean, maybe there's substances like glass which don't absorb or expel anything, so then it's sort of like a much like a free-for-all, but... Uh, so if I were to use a ceramic bowl in a non-kosher kitchen, I could not use that again in a kosher kitchen regardless of 24 hours or anything else? Correct. Because lechet, right? Because lechet chili, you know, like b'diyeved, the food is kosher. Lechet chili. I mean, bowls. Again, what's a non-kosher bowl? I mean, I mean th things that we put on our on our on our tables are rarely in contact with piping hot food. So maybe there's grounds for leniency about if it's a serving. You we can. That's like a second second level conversation. But uh, um, but a yeah. Let's let's say a ceramic. Um, 
uh, what do you call it, um, cr a crock pot, slow cooker, with a ceramic inside part. So if you use that for non-kosher food, uh, even after 24 hours, so after 24 hours, if then kosher food is cooked in it, bidyevid, after the fact, that food is in fact kosher, but with achila, it's forbidden, at initio, it's forbidden to, uh, to use it. And, and, there's, and there's no way to kosher it, so that's tough. Okay, um, okay, source three. Uh, okay. Dagim, let's read slowly because this is a little complicated. Uh, I'll point out that um, this would be much easier if it seems the Shulchan Aruch and even the basic commentaries in the Shulchan Aruch were unaware of the word parv, um, which is really, really interesting. It seems the word was much later than them, which is so interesting because it's such an obvious concept to people who keep kosher and there's no Hebrew word for it, which is very curious. I think the reason why there's no Hebrew word for parav is that um, it's a much less significant concept in halakha than many people think. Okay, and maybe we'll see why right here. Okay, so what's the case? So this is um, in uh, Siman 95, uh, starting at uh, at one. Dagim shnishpalu o shnitzlu bekedera shel basar ruchutzayafe she'ain shum shuman devukba. Mutar lochlam bikutach. Okay, so fish that were cooked or roasted in a meat pan, uh, that a clean meat pan, that was had no meat residue, no fat, no nothing, like a clean, nice meat pan, like our meat pans, meat pans hopefully in our kitchens are. You cook fish, i.e., something pariv in a meat pan, you can eat it with kutach. Kutach is a um, Talmudic, uh, like, from Curds and, bread and the curds, curds, whey, whey, curds and whey. Yes, it's like a dairy uh, dish they loved in Babylonia, in yeah, Babylonia. Okay, so so you can eat this type of. So this is this is what we call like a meat utensil, meat equipment, right? It's a you cook this part of food with meat utensils. You can eat it with um, with dairy, like actually with dairy. Put this fish, sprinkle it, chop it into your kuta. Why? Mishum to have a no ten tam bar no ten tam dehetera. It's no tam, bar no tam. It's a transfer of taste, bar like the son of a transfer, a two degree transfer of taste, a second generation transfer of taste, dehetera, that's still, per everything is permissible. So what does that mean? So we've discussed havaratam, how taste is transferred, that's, that's no tam. that's one thing giving its taste to another. So if something gives its taste to another and then it goes from that thing into something else and so far everything is mutar, everything is permissible, that's called not barnat dehetera. So what's that case? You have something permissible like meat. It goes, it gives its taste into a meat pot. From the meat pot, it then gives its taste into your fish. That is not barnat. That's two degrees of taste transfer from the meat to the pan, from the pan to the fish. So far, everything is mutar. Nothing usur has happened, right? Nothing forbidden, no mixture of meat and milk, no forbidden substance. Everything is kosher. Meat into pan, pan into fish. Everything is still permissible. That's called not bar not dehetera, a permissible second degree transfer of taste. And something which has gone through two degrees of taste transfer and is still <coughs> permissible, that thing, according to the Shulchan Aruch, can be eaten with the opposite gender. Actually eaten, mixed in, eaten together with the opposite gender. Amy. And would it all be null if the pan was used within 24 hours? If the pan had not been used within yeah. 24 hours, then it wouldn't be an issue at all. Like it wouldn't correct. Have been like correct. So this is like assuming it's been used for the 24 hours. Yes, good, exactly. So then why do we have the concept in modern day kosher of putting like dairy equipment or meat equipment on hashkafa? Like we'll, we'll, so we'll get to, there is a distinction with dairy equipment, which we'll get to later. I mean, this, the Ramah is more strict, is somewhat more strict, that's why. There's always somebody more strict. Yeah. Okay. In this case, it's, 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 in kosher, it's usually the Ramah, okay? That's, uh, okay. Um, but he's not, he's, but he's only a little bit more strict, so it's worth uh, paying attention. Uh, okay. Um, but if it's actual, if you haven't cleaned your meat pan first, then it's then you can't eat it with your kutak. That should be obvious. Okay, that's that's Sif one. Sif two. Um, okay, so the case in the Shulchan Aruch is a little more complicated. Um, it's an egg that was boiled in, a, uh, in water 
in a dairy pot, you can take that egg and put it in your chicken, in meat, right, to cook it with meat. Um, even the chachila, no problem whatsoever, but if it was cooked in a um, pot together with meat, even though the egg has its shell on, mm-hmm. uh, then you can't eat it together with, together with kutak, together with dairy. So that, that's you have meat boiling and an egg boiling in the same pot at the same time. And I think he's saying that the nat bar nat would be from the meat to the water and from the water to the egg. And he's saying that, nah, that doesn't work. I think because the water is there, I believe it's like a direct transfer of taste because it's at the same time in the same pot. That's why this, this second case is different. Now the Ramah says, and the Ramah is really, just, sorry, I should have said, the Ramah is Rav Moshe Israelis, who is the um, Ashkenazi gloss on the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, just say one word about the Ramah. He lost in Jewish history, Jewish, public, his, Jewish publishing history, he had this sort of contest with Rav Yosef Karo, uh, and he lost twice in that um, the tour was this great um, 14th century code of Jewish law, and Rav Moshe, Moshe Israelis in Krakow and Rav Yosef Karo in Svat, both had the idea of writing this extensive uh, halachic commentary on the tour, and Rav Yosef Karo published first, his magnum opus, the Beit Yosef. And Rav Moshe Israelis wrote a shorter Ashkenazi glass called the Darche Moshe, where he says, yeah, you left out this and this and this Ashkenazi uh, halachic source, and I'll just you know, uh, add that. Then they each had the idea of writing a condensed, like easy to use uh, you know, c- code of Jewish law. And Rav Yosef Kara published first with the Shulchan Aruch, and the Ramah was left to um, write his, his own Hagaot, his glosses, uh, just to sort of put here and there the places where Ashkenazi psak is different. Um, so he lost that. But in so doing, he made the Shulchan Aruch uh, into a book that is sort of of universal relevance, right? Because both the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramah, they're both on the same page. We can all use the same book. Okay, so he says, V'yeshmach mirim b'tzliyah u'bishul la'asur no tam bar no tam. Skip the, okay, and, and some are strict, okay? Uh, when it comes to roasting or boiling uh, in a case of not bar not. So exactly the case we saw before of the fish or the egg. V'aminhag la'asur la'chadchila u'bidyevin mutar. So what's our Ashkenazi minhag? is to be strict with chachila. We don't cook things, we don't put fish that was roasted in meat pans into our kutach. The chol inyan, okay? The uh, chachila were strict, ad initio, but bidyeved, if you do it, if you put that fish in your kutach, it's fine. Mutar the chol inyan. The dafka le chol im chalav, the habasar atzma, valitznan, the klisha lehem, mutar le chachila. But even the strict Ashkenazi position is to say, okay, don't put your fish roasted in a meat pan directly in with your kuta, but you can put it on your dairy plates. Okay? So you can take, okay? You can take something cooked in a meat pan and serve it on dairy, something par of cooked in meat pans, even for the strict Ashkenazi position, can be served on dairy plates. And vice versa. So you can cook a par of dessert in your dairy baking tins. You can serve it after a meat meal on your meat plates. Does that mean it's a far one? Is the Okay. Yeah, the Sephardi position, the Shulchan Aruch says you can take that fish and put, you actually have it with, you can uh, um, cook pariv, uh, um, uh, pariv, um, uh, whatever, uh, uh, par, uh, par, pariv um, french fries and, and eat them, with, put them on your hamburgers and eat them together, whatever, whatever, like, okay, you can put them in your shawarma like the Israelis do, okay? You can cook part of uh, French fries in your uh, dairy, uh, uh, whatever. It's a bad example. Um, your dairy. You say you have a dairy, the dairy uh, frying thing, deep fryer that you use for making latkes or something. I don't know. So you have your dairy meat fr- uh, deep fryer, and you cook potato chips in your dairy meat fry, uh, deep fryer. You can take those chips and put them in your uh, shawarma, according to the mechaber. Okay, if you're smart. Okay, and the Ashkenazi position is put them on your meat plates, but it can't be in there with the meat itself. Um, oh, yeah. I don't, what's the distinction? Is there, is there somebody, like, it can be on the same plate? Uh, I think it can be on the same plate at the same time, like on the same plate at the same time, or just on those plates? That's a good question. Um, that is a good question, I'm not entirely. There's an excluded middle, right? One case is put it on the, on like the, 
opposite gender plates and the other which is okay. And then the one that the Ramah says we shouldn't do is to actually eat them together. So what about putting them at, eating them at the same time on the same plates? Uh, I don't recall. I don't remember. Uh, okay. And certainly, if it wasn't cooked in a meat or dairy uh, pan, it was just placed on a meat or dairy plate, certainly you can eat it with anything that doesn't affect its power of status. Im hamin hashin. This is very important. Even the Ramah, even the strict position of the Ramah, Amy, acknowledges that if the meat or dairy um, pot or pan had not been used for 24 hours, and so the taste that it has absorbed is a rancid taste, then something par of you cook in those can be eaten with the other gender. So, and so, so most, th- most of the time in our kitchen, you cook something par of, you know, unless you know for sure that you use that meat or dairy pot for meat or dairy within 24 hours, unless you know for sure, certain, we assume it wasn't used for meat or dairy within 24 hours, and so something par that you cook can be eaten directly with uh, something of the opposite gender. So you can cook pasta in a dairy pot and then eat it with meat sauce, okay? Etc. Okay. Um, uh, oh, but then there's an important caveat, which I should have mentioned earlier where we discussed uh, the general t- concept of tam lifgam, of rancid taste. But this is all assuming that the thing is not a devar harif, not something spicy or sharp. Um, okay, if, if the taste is, if it's something spicy, then we're concerned. Even if it's, um, even if it's, uh, Pagum, otherwise pagum, because something spicy, we, we are worried that it awakens the rancid taste and makes it taste good again. So if you have a dairy frying pan and you fry some onions, so the rancid 24 hours old dairy that's in your frying pan gets like freshened up and awakened by the onions, and now these onions have tasty good dairy flavor, and so those onions then uh, have the status of something dairy, and they can't be eaten with with uh, with meat, nor should they even be like, like they have the dairy status. So they shouldn't be served even on, dairy, on meat plates, shouldn't be eaten after meat, because um, they have the status of dairy if it's something to Barkarif. So onions, garlic, um, a few other things of that sort. I'm sorry, what? what are other things? Horseradish, harif, sharp things. Schug, yes. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> so let's say you have a dairy knife and you cut something. If I, uh, this is not sharp in my mind. Is it where? If you, it's, it's you have a double. You have the sharpness of the like you cut something with a dairy knife. Onions with a dairy knife. So normally, if it was, if you cut a carrot with a dairy knife, the carrot would be fully parved. If you cut an onion with a dairy knife, the onion, because of the sharpness of the onion, and also like, you also feel like the pressure of the knife as well, is kind of like part of this uh, equation. We uh, believe, we're worried the onions would have a would have a dairy status. Um, but what makes the knife actually dairy? Why would then, if you use it, for, good question. How would a knife actually be dairy if you use it to cut um, lasagna? Hours. No, like because the onion, the, the onion awakens the the onion awakens the taste. So if you're like, about the, 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 the so would like make it not. What if what if you wash? Washing would be fine. Yeah, that yeah that we just yeah washing. If you wash a knife with the raw with onion, that would be fine. Oh oh uh, yeah, uh, the onions can't make onions can make a old taste no longer pagum. Onions can't make something that actually is like, like soap tastes good. Onions don't make soap taste good, right? So, okay. So if you have onion residue in your, on your dishes and you wash them with soap, et cetera, et cetera, the soap still makes everything rancid and all those leniencies and safety would apply. What about uh, the knife though? Yeah, the kn- knife as well. I mean, the knife is being washed, but if you cut onions with a knife, uh, the, the onions sort of awaken the rancid dairy in the knife itself. Even after it's been washed? 
Yeah, yeah, the soap doesn't, yeah, because soap, the soap doesn't, the soap does, isn't like absorbed into the, the, the soap is, the idea is that the soap is there in this mixture. You have dairy and meat and all in the sink together with soap, then there's not going to be a problematic transfer of taste. You understand? But, it, but you still have, the knife itself still has whatever it has absorbed inside it from what was used for something hot. So piping hot lasagna, you cut with a knife. I mean, you might use a different kind of knife, like your sharp knife that you use to cut onions, you probably don't use to cut lasagna. And the sharp knife you use for cutting cheese, you probably don't use for lasagna. Okay, this, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I, I was wondering, um, I know my parents at home usually, like if they cut the knife, if they cut the onion with a dairy knife, and then they want to use the remainder of the onion for the meat, they cut off that part. Yes, kadei klipa. So, with, since it's cold, it only is, um, it's only oser kadei klipa. It's only like one layer of the onion that is measured, that, that, that this oh, taste. So you okay. can take a part, you can sort of cut in from the edge, from the cutting edge, and that would be, everything's fine. Oh. Okay. With a different knife. With a different knife, with right. a part knife. <laughs> yes. Could it be a fleshing knife? Yes, you could use a fleshing knife, like, you know, half a centimeter in from the, yes. the plane that you cut, and then you take that middle wedge and discard that, and then the rest is The rest would be flaky knives for you. Uh, yes, Marilyn. Uh, say you're staying at a hotel with free breakfast, and they have hard boiled eggs, which were cooked in a non-kosher pot. Can you eat them? Huh. So let's sort of think this through. Uh, it's a commercial kitchen, so we, if it was, if it was, if you were, um, you know, in olden times, and you were traveling, if you were going to an inn, and the innkeeper, yeah, two other, okay. Um, all, the halakhot of travel, it's an, interesting way to, it's an interesting question whether or not they apply in modern times, because in the old times, like before, you know, like recently, nobody traveled for fun. Travel was dangerous and unpleasant, and the only reason why you traveled was because you had to earn a living by like being an itinerant merchant or to some business opportunity or to escape, you know, the Cossacks, whatever. Like, nobody traveled <laughs> for fun. So the leniencies of travel, it's unclear, you know, like, not, it's unclear whether it should, it should apply for some taking a pleasure trip where mm -hmm. with a little bit of advanced research you can, like, you know, arrange for, like, excellence in Kashu. Um, so that's one thing. So if it was, if it were, um, so this, the pot they're using, if, if the pot they're using to cook your eggs, um, if they use that pot within 24 hours to cook something non-kosher, then the eggs are not kosher. So the likelihood that they, that would be the case. So if it's a if it's a breakfast um, kitchen, breakfast. if it, they only serve breakfast and it's only their egg pots, then it would be fine. Um, if it were a private kitchen, Bidi Eved, it would be fine since Bidi Eved, right, once it's been cooked, the food is kosher, even a non-kosher pot. Commercial kitchen, we assume they're using it much more frequently, we don't have that leniency, and so the only grounds for leniency would be some way to ascertain that they only use those pots for eggs. Which might be possible. It could be. It could be that with a conversation behind the kitchen, that, that, that in fact is the case. Like, this is our egg pot, you know, and they only, it's a, it's a small, it's a hotel, they only serve breakfast, and the only thing they cook are eggs, and they fry things. And so, no, like, the I'm only... No, that's what I'm saying, exactly, meaning the only thing that the only pot, the only thing they use a pot for would be eggs, in which case that would be fine. This is why, by the way, we, there, you can be lenient with like a lot of, you know, um, like a lot of Starbucks stuff you can be lenient on, right? I, there was, um, this was my, uh, my, my, a few years ago, like the, the CRC issued a like kind of warning about Starbucks several years ago, and they, I, I was like very alarmed and, and went to my local Starbucks and met with the manager who showed me like how they, um, make their stuff and wash their things, right? The concern was maybe since they do serve like ham sandwiches, right, at Starbucks and they heat them and they use like, what if they, what if the statue that they're using for like heating, you know, for taking their piping hot grilled cheese and ham sandwiches off the thing and flipping it, whatever, what if they wash those spatulas in the same sink at the same time with the carrot that they use for making coffee or the thing they use for stirring the milk and the cappuccino, whatever. What if they wash them all together in the same sink with piping hot water? Then that would be a kosher concern. So I went I to. Soap. I it what if they fill the sink with hot water before they add the soap? Oh. They stick it all in the sink together, put in the boiling hot water, piping hot water, and then they pour in the soap and start washing it. So I went to the start. So first of all, they said that many, most of the coffee, like the brewed coffee utensils, are washed in a separate, like special sink just for the coffee products as if a special method for like cleaning only the coffee things. 
and maybe some of the cappuccino, like the thing for scooping the milk or this or that, might be washed in, the, in a sink, in the non-coffee sink, but they have a special like proprietary soap water mixture. They don't want to like waste soap or not have enough soap, so there's actually a spigot that they have in their sinks that soap water comes out into the sink. So they would never have like just hot water filling the sink. They like turn the spigot and soapy water comes out into the sink. Uh, so you, again, it's like a special like you know mixture of soap and water, special ratio they have. Uh, and so uh, I was satisfied. I called the CRC and like I think by the time I called, they had like already like revoked and like uh, and they revised the that, that it was like a draft document that they revoked and revised. So this was like my moment, of, like my proudest moment. I guess. <laughs> Vegan restaurant. What do you have to worry? So what do we have to worry about in a vegan restaurant? So because we know that there's nothing in the past that is. Probably so let's see what the issue with a vegan restaurant could be. Okay. It could be a few things. One is what are their standards of washing fruits and vegetables for insects? Maybe they're not. In fact, we know that uh, there's a story. I don't know, in fact, whatever. It's a story I heard that there was some group of vegan Hindus or whatever. They came from India to England and they started having nutritional problems that they never had. In India, and it's because in England, their fruits and vegetables, like their diet and grain, whatever, had much fewer insect infestations, and so they weren't getting the protein that they were, that insects had been supplying in their diet. So maybe they're not washing things sufficiently for insects. Two, are they using non kosher wine or non kosher vinegar? Those are vegan, those could be really non kosher, and if they're using them in their ingredients, which they probably would, uh, vinegar especially, then um, that could, as, it, as they cook with it, et cetera, that could make the pots and pans like kosher. Three, if they're using processed foods in the restaurant as ingredients, like what are their definite standards of uh, vegan versus our standards of vegan? Maybe some processed foods that we would say is problematic, uh, they wouldn't like. They, you know, like we, carmine is a coloring, you know, which is made from crushed beetles. They, they may not know about that, or they may, they may not, uh, if it's only used as a dye, maybe they wouldn't care about it and we would, so that would be an issue with the vegan restaurant. Maybe if they run out of frying pans, you know, five minutes, you know, in the middle of a shift, do they run to the, you know, the greasy spoon next door to borrow a frying pan or not, right? Uh, no. Right, things that a kosher restaurant wouldn't do, like maybe a vegan restaurant. So, so it, it's, it's, I guess it's possible, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to provide kosher certification to a vegan restaurant, but I, I wouldn't uh, eat at one without kosher certification because of those concerns. Again, I guess you can decide how real you think those are, and maybe each different restaurants would be different depending on how the seriousness of their veganism or the, the process that you might learn about how they prepare things. I don't know. I think I feel like I, I they're probably not going to use like lard. I mean, like McDonald's was sued right some years ago for using lard to, like lard in their French fry, you know, thing. And, and but they don't claim to be. They don't claim to. They don't claim to. But but a, I don't know. Maybe like, I could imagine some. Like, there was this grapefruit flavored beer that I that was um, that that I saw that's made it's, the color is colored with carmine, which is a beetle mm. derivative, and like you could totally imagine your. Like, it's not the type of thing that a vegan restaurant would be concerned about. So, okay, so don't order the carmine flavored beer. But if they're using similar types of ingredients in their cooking, then it could have implications for the pots and pans and then other things that they cook. Yes? Um, just to annoy me during your talk in the last five minutes, Great. would the major issue for a vegan restaurant be Bishul Akhtam? Oh, Bishul Akhtam, yeah. Is there a reason against saying that Bishul Akhtam applies to vegetarian restaurants? No, Bishul Akhtam, yes, thank you. So, Bishul Akhtam is also a rabbit, thank you. There's also a, well, Yes, there's also, Bishul Akum is a rabbinic decree against eating food that has been cooked by a Gentile. This is a rabbinic decree as a intermarriage prevention measure. There are a number of, uh, so this only applies to food that is ole al shulchan malachim, refined food, gourmet food that would be served before a king. There's a question about how the parameters of that, like if, you know, potato chips would never be served before a king but potatoes would. So like how now or broad do we find that? Tuna fish, like tuna steak you would, but canned tuna fish you wouldn't. So the kosher agencies tend to be pretty lenient about that, like the canned tuna fish, there's no Jew involved in the cooking process, but because the kosher agencies say it's not a leal shulchan malachim, a king would never be served canned food, even though tuna fish is a delicacy and a king would be served uh, canned food. Anything that could be eaten raw doesn't fall under the prohibition of, uh, of um, Bishul Aquam, and so a vegan restaurant, I mean, I guess most of the food, well, I don't know, I guess a potato. Much of the food at a vegan restaurant, I guess, since it could be, if it's vegetables, they could be eaten raw. I guess not, not exclusively, though. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Maybe you could say Fikinfoot anyway isn't fit for a king. That's not true. Kings could eat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's fighting words. No, I mean, a king could eat like a really lovely, you know, uh, you know, fancy spaghetti with a lovely marinara sauce or something. Like, yes? I don't want to take you too, oh, I don't want to take you too much off the topic, but in order for short of time, I have a question about um, a real, like on a rooftop, for example. It's not commercial, but it's also not private. Can I eat on that? Can I just, should I just put down like, do you know what I mean? Like, like, a, like, a, like a barbecue grill, a grilling yeah, grill. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to be either. That's, see, that's going to be stricter because you have the actual residue on it. So the residue is charred, but maybe it gives a good flavor to the next thing you cook on it. Uh, and because the food is actually directly coming in contact with the grill, we have a whole, a, a whole rubric of stricter halachot would apply. So the grill, if you put, if you wrap a potato in aluminum foil really well, then that could go on a grill. It isn't kosher, I think. Um, there are ways to cost your grill, but you could also, you could just, if you take off the grill, and put, you can buy, maybe you can just buy, depending on the type of, like if it's a charcoal Weber grill, you can buy like your own. Well, I also heard there's actual like disposable things you can put on it. That would be a thing? Probably, no? probably, because even though the, whatever non-kosher stuff is dripped into the charcoal, yeah. that those will be koshered by the glowing hot, as the coals get glowing hot, that will kosher the, um, the stuff in that part of the grill. And so you just have to worry about the grill. Okay, Mincha should begin now. Uh, you can welcome to email me or call me or we could schedule another session. This was a lot of fun for me. I'm happy to do this again if there's interest. Um, maybe we'll stay in here and dive in Mincha in this room. If, if many of you or some of you could stay, it'd be lovely to have Mincha and Mara with a nice large uh, crowd. So consider sticking around and we'll start Mincha in like one minute. So quickly uh, find Cedarim and find your seats.